Welcome to the RFLMS Unlicensed Podcast. I'm Caleb. We've got Tassos here with us. And today we're talking to Chris Johnson from Skynet Communications. So really looking forward to this conversation. He's got a wealth of experience in the industry and does some really cool stuff. But before we get into that, Tassos, give the good people their call to action or whatever you're supposed to do on a YouTube video. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't forget to like, listen, or subscribe to our channel right here on YouTube or anywhere you download your audio podcasts like Google, Spotify, or Apple. Hey, Chris, what's going on, man? We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today and tell us all about you, your past, your history, your WISP, uh, and anything else you really want to talk about. So again, thanks for taking the time, man. Yeah, absolutely. Super excited to be here. Um, obviously, Chris Johnson, Skynet Communications. Uh, I've been doing the WISP thing for, I don't know, around 24 years now. Um, started back when... Uh, you know, modems were 56K or a little before that. And then uh, we tried to figure out a better way to do things back before 802.11 existed. And uh, we've kind of worked from there before 802.11 with Symbol and Lucent and all the original guys to I worked for wireless ISP for um, actually that was family owned for, for a long time. And then uh, about 10 years ago or so, um, started my own with some friends and uh, ended up just kind of taking taking off from there for for my wireless ISP and and growing to the point where we have two ISPs now the one in Bozeman and the one in Virginia and uh, then of course beta testing and and doing consulting work around the United States and that's kind of it till today. That's awesome. <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, we've known each other for quite a few years now, and I, I didn't even realize you went back that far either, right? It wasn't until I think it was like a couple of weeks ago on Facebook, you started to kind of getting into it with some guy talking about LTE, and he's like, you know, I, I got more letters in my whatever than you do. He's like, I've been doing this longer than you. And you're like, I don't think so. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I was like, damn, yeah. Chris goes way back, bro. I was like, I had no idea. I had no idea. So it's the, we're, Caleb and I are, are not the oldest ones anymore, right? Because we're always like, you know, we're the old timers it's like you're actually an older timer than we are in this game here you know right yeah absolutely nope uh wireless i guess has always just been fascinating so um you know it's one of those uh trades that again it, it's a trade there's no college for it or anything else yeah. so a lot of people yeah. get into it which is really exciting gives people a, an avenue to go do something in the technology world and uh make pretty good money doing it if, if you're good at it yeah, I actually Googled it. I mean, that's literally how I got started in this whole thing. You know, I was actually uh, working in the semiconductor industry uh, and it was during the, you know, the bust, right? When everybody, you know, everything was starting to ship off seas. I was actually in China uh, on some lone labor project uh, between one, you know, a semiconductor factory to another. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just walking around like, you know, you know, just pondering stuff you know you got millions of people around you and i'm like the world is huge i'm like i wonder what the next big thing is going to be and i just see all these people with cell phones and at the time it really wasn't wireless data on your internet right it was just you know cell phones was really starting to become popular and i'm like i think wireless is the next the next big thing you know and and after watching layoff after layoff after layoff at the company i was at and I started seeing, you know, you know, they were laying off the good people. You know, when the first initial layoffs happening, like, well, that guy was a freaking slacker. You know, <laughs> you know, he, <laughs> yeah. he he wasn't worth being an employee anyway. You know, then you're like, holy shit! It's like this that guy was actually good. You know, I knew that there was no allegiance. You know, you know, corporate America is just gonna pull your name out of a hat and say, I don't care how good you've been to me, it's your time to go. So uh, yeah, so I, I started googling like wireless, and I found this whole Wisp kind of thing and Wi-Fi, and yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I had zero training in networking, zero training in wireless. Just learned everything with the Googles, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. That was even before the Googles and some of the points. So. <laughs> okay. That's a little true. bit of a similar story here. You know, I was in college, uh, 98. I uh, got my first taste of high-speed broadband. You know, we had 100 meg on campus in the Ooh. dorms. We're like, this is amazing. And then we'd go home, go, you know, stay at the summer with your parents or between <laughs> quarters or whatever, and you just start getting all jittery. You're like, I need some of that that, that good stuff. So <laughs> Buddy and I were like, yeah, we're going to start a WISP and cobble together some equipment. Quickly realized there were too many trees in central Georgia to, to get this done at the time. So... Started fooling around with equipment, 
um, early 2000s, uh, started doing some consulting work and stuff like that. And then kind of dot, 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 here we are. So I've been in distribution, been in manufacturing, back to manufacturing now, um, doing stuff. I mean, the stuff now, like we're looking at some of the arrays where customers are building and stuff. And I'm like 20 years ago, if I'd have known that, I'd, it, it'd have broken my mind for sure. <laughs> what, what we can do now with the technology that's available. So kind of been there, done that. Um, but it's always good to talk to someone, especially, you know, we've got such a mix of people that we talk to, whether it's, you know, folks like yourself that have been doing this forever or someone's like, yeah, three years ago, I didn't know what a whips was. And then <laughs> oh, whips. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I want to start a whips. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then you're like, all right. So a little easier to get the information. Now there weren't things back then like Wispa and you know, uh, all these outreach and educational channels and stuff like that. But it's always, it's always really fun to, to get someone's story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you're with, so tell us a little bit about Skynet communications, like what areas you're covering. So you've got two networks. Are you focused on business or residential, you know, coverage areas, things like that. Like, tell us a little bit what you're working with here. Yeah. So when I started Skynet, um, not a lot of money. Um, and I think I could start back then with less money than you can today, but, uh, I didn't have a lot of money. So we, we targeted where the money was at, which is uh, business. And uh, so for the first seven years, we, we ran um, all business. I just, you know, people would call in and ask about residential and I'd say, well, here's your other, your options. We just don't do that. Um, and so that got us going um, pretty well. We, we made a pretty good base off of that. And uh, because of that, we had a lot of contacts anyway from, um, all the employees that worked at the business and everything because they employees talk. Right. So, yeah. Um, we then, gosh, it's been uh, three years ago, four years ago now, three years ago, we uh, decided we were going to start doing the residential game. Um, we had enough infrastructure built. That's, that's always the other part too, right. Is you want to do residential, but residential is, is everywhere. Business is in a, in a smaller focused area. So it's easier to, to hit those people with fewer towers, fewer resources, things like that. Um, also easier to maintain a, a network when it's not sprawled out all over the place. So, um, business was the logical choice for me. Um, then uh, now we're doing residential. We've got 23 towers, I think, um, in, in our area that spread out across uh, multiple cities. We I consider the Gallatin Valley just one area, but it is um, Bozeman, Belgrade, Four Corners, Gallatin Gateway. And then we now just recently started going about 30 miles away to uh, Livingston, Montana. Um, and then... Uh, on one of my consulting uh, gigs, I ran into some folks in Virginia and uh, we ended up hitting it off pretty good and they needed a lot of help to, to turn things around, right? Um, it, it's a guy who got into the wireless ISP industry and he, he didn't know exactly what he was getting into. So we, uh, <laughs> we kind of- so the taco truck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. You know, we kind of educated him on, uh, on a lot of things. Um, you know, I don't uh, like to pick on anything, but the, the the tool from Ubiquity is pretty misleading. I've, I've dealt with a lot. Of people. <laughs> you don't say. Yes, we're, right? yeah. we're familiar with this concept, Surprise. right? Yeah, yeah. Hey, it goes over this hilltop by two feet. Like it should work, right? And it's like, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that's the that was the kicker, right? They draw these big circles. Everybody does, right? They they get the tool, they draw the big circle, and it seems like it's you can keep expanding it and it keeps saying that there's coverage and you're going. Anyway, and so in Virginia where there's a lot of hills and trees, not so much. In fact, uh and it's a different topography than than Bozeman, Montana. So that's the one thing you learn as a consultant. Anything that worked in one place doesn't necessarily work in the next place. And absolutely demographics are different what people will spend for installs versus a monthly fee is different Every, everything's just different about the people and the culture so um that was a little bit of a interesting learning uh, for me in uh, strasburg virginia um but ultimately it it led to a partnership um that's gone really well um and uh that's that's kind of it from for skynet communications 
Okay. You know, it's funny. My wife asked me a while back and we're like, Hey, we're interviewing these with for these podcasts. And she's like, well, you know, won't they all end up being the same? And I was like, no, like <laughs> not even remotely. Like you could get 20 whiffs in a room and there's going to be 20 types of environments they deal with 20 technology approaches, 20 sources of funding, ways of doing business, everything like that. So the variety of, uh, with operators that are out there, I think is really what makes this interesting and gives us the ability to really try to shed some light on, you know, what are you guys doing? How are you doing it? What have you learned and can share and things like that? So this is why this has been really fun for Tassos and I to be able to do this for sure. Yeah. I mean, even, even here in Texas within the same state, I mean, the topography, of the state you know if you go to east texas you got these huge pine trees and stuff if you come to central texas it's a little a little flatter a little more arid so it's more like deserty and then you know if you go to west texas i mean you got you know you know larger hills you don't have mountains here like you guys have right but that that changes the way things propagate you know so it's totally totally different you could have you know five different types of you know deployments and stuff or deployment scenarios in just one state never mind across the country it's crazy Oh yeah. Yep. For sure. For sure. So being in Montana, uh, which is known to get a little chilly, uh, but also, you know, there's a lot of extreme weather, the, the winds and everything like that. So if you can kind of share a little bit about like, what are the challenges that you face from an environmental perspective, getting places, um, power, I got to imagine power, especially as you start to work in these like slightly remoter areas, you know, you've got to have a lot of concerns with maintaining stable power, just things like that. What, what have you run into that maybe a lot of other folks in the industry don't really see on a daily basis yeah so um obviously weather is the the big one the temperature swings um for us have always been a a big deal which is one of the things that we've learned in the radio testing world that uh our weather tends to show some other things that that other weather doesn't so we uh (laughs) we can see negative 10 one day and then the next day it's up to 45 degrees right yep and so you get these huge swings that um, cause some issues. And then of course we get um, the really wet, heavy snow. That's what, that's our storm um, more or less. Uh, not so much really heavy rain, um, but the the snow that sticks to everything. And that's, that's what educates you where you put some things that are a little bit weaker signal or you think it's going to work right up until you find out that it's got, you know, two inches of slush sitting on the front side of the antenna. <laughs> and uh, now you're driving there going, well, that, that's not strong enough signal for that, even though I thought it was. Um, so th- those are our biggest deals. Solar, um, I know it's great for people in Arizona, um, obviously, probably <laughs> in Texas and, and yeah. in the lower half. I can tell you, solar, not so much here. I got educated on that. Um, I, I started out really cheap, small solar site. And uh, now it's four panels that are 300 watts just so I can maintain a, a small one access point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. One access point and a link. Yeah, um, it, it's interesting. You, you find out where power draw is becomes a lot bigger deal um, on radios and, and then it starts limiting what you can and can't do. Um, obviously, your your Wi-Fi chipsets don't don't burn a lot of power, but a lot of this custom silicone and and, and other stuff is uh, changing um, rapidly on on different products, LTU or Tirana or even Cambium stuff. And you look at the power draw, and you're going, "Well, I won't be using that here." Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. So it's it's interesting. We um, we only have the one solar site. Uh, it really educated me to the point where. I will pay the money to drag the power there or I don't wow. do the site. Um, we're going to look into some other things, obviously wind alternatives, but traditionally they haven't been um, really great for cold weather. Um, if you go look at the ratings, they're usually rated to 30 degrees or 20 degrees. They don't go, well, it's rated to negative, you know, 20 or mm-hmm. negative 40. And so with ice on it and things like that. And so, the last thing I want to do is be going up the side of the mountain uh, to take care of that. So we haven't done a lot of wind. I think that's going to be, we found some companies we want to try out some stuff and maybe that'll help um, with our solar site. But for now um, we've stuck to, if we can't get power there, or at least I can't afford to drag power there, we're not building the site. But yeah, power is uh, important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. And we switched to, to pretty much DC everywhere, which of course I preach to everybody. Um, 
I used to do AC for for years and years, like everybody else. You buy this UPS or you do this because it's got SNMP monitoring and, and all that. Um, ended up with more electronics failed on the towers, let alone my UPSs, everything else. We switched to DC. Our equipment failure from manufacturers went down to, I don't know, 1%, less than 1%. Um, yeah, it's with, clean. No yeah, surges. Right. And it told me that's not the manufacturers, which is who always gets blamed, right? Oh, this this stuff sucks. Uh, not really. Well, I mean, there, there, there could be slight, right? Because it depends on how they build their power supplies as well. So they could filter some of that stuff out, clean it up a little bit better. But yeah, I mean, generally, it's the, the power that's being supplied that's pretty crappy, right? Yeah. How, how did the batteries last? So, I mean, I, I know batteries don't like it when it's really cold either. So are you running any special kind of batteries out there? due to your temperatures or I mean pretty much the standard mill that everybody else uses. Yeah. So ultimately, again, this is where the environment stuff um, is a big factor for us. Um, the latest thing we started doing is silicon dioxide batteries. Mm -hmm. um, they come out of Canada um, and uh, they're rated all the way down to negative 40, I think is what they're yeah. rated to. Um, and so, and they don't have a huge drop off. So for years, um, on the solar sites or sitting on the side of these mountains, I, I ran AGMs and, uh, you know, and I bought uh, sun extender AGMs, which are, I mean, there's really nice AGM batteries. Um, but again, it would get cold. And then all of a sudden I would lose 40% of my battery capacity, um, especially at my solar site. That's where I got educated. Um, so we switched to these silicon dioxide batteries and we've seen a significant amount of I guess, uh, battery reserve that we wouldn't normally see. So I'm not running my generator. I do have a, a Honda generator that sits up there that we can remotely turn on and off. Unfortunately, the gas runs out and we do have to <laughs> go there to fill it up. But, but it buys uh, you some more time at least, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Buys us, buys us some time. Um, the other one I wanted to do was um, lithium titanate, but so expensive. Um, yeah. It's great. It's a dry cell, right? It's it's literally you could drill into it and you your battery still works. It's it's a cool technology. Just super no more expensive. no more poof, <laughs> right. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so those those are our two battery technologies. Everything else for us is kind of uh, failed unless it's indoor, right? And then we we're like everybody else. We go, you know what? AGMs just way less cost. It's available. Absolutely in here. So. Electricity gets a little weird when you get it twenty neg twenty and neg thirty. Like there's a lot of quirky things that I've seen at least from from past experiences dealing with customers or or the one that usually gets people are like, Yeah, my radios are rated to neg forty, but you know, are your switches, are your batteries? If you do lose a site, right, and everything shuts down until the power comes back, you know, will it boot? You know, those are operational yeah. temperatures. Thermal starts so, exactly. Yeah, cold starts. You know, they're are like hard. Yeah, none of my stuff boots up. Well, it's negative thirty out there, if not colder, because now you've got to add a thousand foot of elevation to what the the weather thing is actually reporting. Now none of your stuff boots up because it's way too cold, and you gotta wait for the sun to kind of peak over. So it's it's challenging. I used to have a lot of customers up in Yellowknife, and they're like, "Yeah, none of this is gonna work the way you think it's gonna work, dude." <laughs> I had to get educated a bit on that. So yeah, yep. and it's always like you know never the ideal opportunity to go out there now. Um. Do you have any cool tips and tricks about like radomes, you know, with coatings or anything like that to help sort of keep as much of that wet slushy snow, you know, off your dishes as you can, or is it just kind of, you know, let it ride? What have, what have you found spray. out Isn't about there a spray that? that you can put on the radomes or something? Yeah. You know, I've seen people talk about it. Honestly, we've never done it. Um, we, uh, <laughs> we took a little bit different approach. We, we try to design everything to a spec where we know that, no matter what we've seen, it's going to run, which limits us a little bit, right? So we're not, we don't stretch the distances as much. So I'm not trying to run something at a negative 70 or even a 65. Most of my stuff runs at negative 40s. 60 or below. Yeah, 40s. And we do heat Chris some likes stuff it hot. Up, right? Chris likes it hot. We always talk about <laughs> this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're like, uh, do you really need this size dish at this? Well, yeah, Nake 38 is fine. So, <laughs> yeah, that's how you keep everything warm so it doesn't freeze in the winter, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah, so that, that's what we've traditionally done. Um, obviously, 60 gigahertz, you can't do that, right? That, that's a yeah, it's not tolerant of anything. So, 
uh, Ray domes have become a, a big deal. Um, LTU, or sorry, Air Fiber 60 LR, big educator for um, Ubiquity, I think. Um, a lot of people <laughs> bought it. They put it out. They go, oh, this is really great. And then the first, you know, little bit of snow or whatever, and, and your link doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Look, it goes four miles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. So there, there's a lot of people, I think, that have been pretty disappointed in, in that fact. They, they put these links out and they were, everything's great and wonderful right up until the snow hits. And then I'm not the one that discovered the, the problem with the Ray Dome. Um, I guess you put the Ray Dome on the, on the front, but then because it's at a grid, um, the ice blows through the backside, right? And it just fills right. it up. I saw somebody talking about that and I thought, you know, that is, that's true. It's something that I didn't think about. Um, I don't, I don't have the problem. Generally, most all of ours are facing in such a way that they, they don't have that, um, issue, but then I'm going, yeah, okay, this, this isn't really that great of a design. So there's, there's a lot of things everybody goes through it and learns, uh, at different paces. Um, I think with that kind of stuff. And I, I mean, so that design, like that grid sort of set up, I mean, I think Microtech started with that first before anybody with uh, some of their equipment. And even it wasn't even 60 gig. I think they started in five gig first and then it, it just kind of evolved. And I know everybody was always worried about that saying, you know, this just doesn't seem like it's a smart mechanical design, you know, you know, just you would imagine that the ice would just get in there and when it freezes up, it, it would just start breaking all that stuff and uh you know i never really see a lot of the the bad pictures for that stuff i wonder if people are just like well you know whatever let's let's you know <laughs> let's not post that kind of stuff you know but uh it seems like ubiquity likes to take a lot of those uh designs that you know aren't great and use them themselves right so they <laughs> they, they probably could have done better <laughs> they could have done better yeah. but it's so, sometimes it's easier to copy you know Oh yeah. No, I think, I think it'll change like everything, um, enough complaints, enough drop off product. Um, you know, I, I have a feeling they'll change some, some other things that we run into, uh, in the snow world really with the, uh, ice, um, the can form on top of stuff is you think, oh, well, this has a ray dome. So it's, it's a really good, um, deal, but depending on how flat that ray dome is, um, the snow can then, the ice can grab on top and then it literally just starts building further and further down the front till yeah, it's yeah. covered anyway. So if you don't have, just because you got a ray dome doesn't mean anything. It, you have to make your, uh, I guess, antennas a lot uh, sharper edged at the top with not a, not a lot of depth to them. Otherwise it'll hold the ice and snow there and, and it'll stay there for days. Right. Um, the unfortunate part. So yeah, it's like the crystals just grow little by little. It just encapsulates it no matter what. So it's not yeah. it's not about it sticking to it like, you know, because of the wind or whatever. It just kind of grows on it. Yep, yep, exactly. And that and that was another thing we learned um, in, in the 60 gigahertz world. Really, the 60 gig is the educator on, on a lot of things is um, our access points, the wave access points um, have a very flat top to them. And, and so we did get a a really good storm and the ice was built over the top and, and it was um, hanging on there for probably a couple days before it, it disappeared. And um, lucky enough, again, we don't try to push the, the envelope on things. Um, we have certain metrics we stay in and we just know that unless it's just really, really terrible, most clients are going to stay running. Um, right. So we, we try to stick below like NAIC 48 on our signal levels on, on a 60 gigahertz on channels uh, four, five, and six. If it's three, two, and one, well, then it has to be even stronger than that um, to survive things. But I give out that metric and then some other guy goes, oh, man, we we don't have to do that. But, you know, they're in Utah or wherever. Yeah. And I'm going, well, yeah, absolutely. You, you can get away with more or something like that. But Yeah, yeah. And the Wave AP is that like... PA speaker looking thing, right? That's the multi-point access point, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and that thing um, has done really, really well for us. Uh, point to multi-point in the, in the 60 gigahertz world. I don't, haven't seen anything else from anybody else like it. If you want to do long, range, right? Um, right? Multitude of short range stuff because there, there's a lot of Qualcomm out there, but uh, at the long range, you know, we're, we're one mile out for, for clients point to multi-point. 
um, and running 20, 24, seven, 365 through the storms, things like that. Um, but again, I could push it to a mile and a half, uh, maybe a mile and three quarters. I just know that anytime a storm rolled through a bad one, um, we'd have a problem. So, yeah, so it's been, um, every, everything's an education. 60 gigahertz is definitely a, a big deal for people. We can push a lot of data, um, but it's so new that uh, we're all still learning, I think, in that world. So have you tested the other ones? I mean, Microtech 60 gig, IgniteNet, I mean, is, is pretty much did you just roll with Ubiquity and kind of stay there because it did what you wanted or did you go some other routes? <clears throat> yeah, so IgniteNet, all right? I was, I was pretty big in IgniteNet um, for a while. Uh, that was kind of the first big intro, I think, for the, the wireless ISP industry for point to multipoint and 60 gigahertz. And then I have to hand it to them. They really, they're the ones that, like you guys with the twist port, um, they're the they're the the guys that really started the point to multi point sixty gigahertz revolution for the wireless mm -hmm. ISP industry. Now, they, in my opinion, they've died off, you know, quite a bit. But um, that's where a lot of education was done as well. They've they've got a ray dome thing where it's long and flat, and we'd get these mohawks built up the the center of them with <laughs> snow, and and then it didn't work anymore, and um you know how does beam forming work and they did um only beam forming on the ap and not on the cpe um which in some ways actually made things easier um and in other ways uh, made it not as nice so my installer hated the fact that um on the ignite net it was really fine-tuned adjustment on the cpe i mean just a little bit left or right and all of a sudden you've you've lost signal because there's no beam forming so you got yeah. this tiny little beam but um it uh it gave us a good education on on 60 gigahertz and, and what to expect in channels one through four four and a half and then from there we did uh micro when they came out with uh their 60 gigahertz stuff we put that out um that's where I learned that the Qualcomm stuff was really a lot lower power, a lot, a lot lower um, gain on, on stuff. And so I thought, okay, well, it works for micro pops in, in these really small areas. We have um, warehouse districts, like a lot of people where everybody kind of like lives in their office or yeah. whatever. Um, great opportunities there because they, they try to cram everything, a lot of people into a small area. And so, so it works well there. The micro tick, um, just like the ignite net had a lot of issues in the beginning right we had a lot of disconnects there's some of them that said you know you'd come back and look at them after a month or something it's like 2700 disconnects or some ridiculous number right and wow. <laughs> yeah and it got better and better and the disconnects were, were so quick and you know people didn't notice on certain things um but yeah then they came out with the 180 degree sector that mm -hmm. thing is well I'm not a fan <laughs> of it, right? It's it takes five years for it to scan through all of the different things, and then <laughs> anything changes, it's rescanning, and it just uh, it was a great concept. Sounded cool that you could have this 180 degree thing. I think their 60 degree sectors are, are way better than the 180. Um, but but Microtix learned, you know, they've got the the new little. Uh, dish i can't even remember nray i think um that's the new one um and it's got a cover on it and, and their new little sector i just got that thing in um i mean it fits in the palm of your hand right oh, the little little box looking thing yeah it almost looks yeah. like it's a camera right without a lens yep so so that's very cool um you know i i don't we try it all um if it's in the five gigahertz world uh right we've tried i haven't tried the the cambium 60 gigahertz stuff um that's one i just stayed away from i originally thought i was going to do it um and then uh what what's the company that came along um and they're not even doing it tachyon right you Ooh, see this i haven't heard that name in a while yeah yeah tachyon networks right they oh we're going to be out last year in uh, june or july and here we are this year they still haven't launched a product um at this point, I don't know if it's a company that makes it. 
Chips at uh, Chips at Market's gotten a little tough for new upstarts to really get dug in. So. Yeah, you, you don't have the quantity, you don't have the muscle behind you or the money. It's just like, okay, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll have your parts for you in you know twenty twenty five. You know, yeah, yeah, you're way that's... way down on the list. <laughs> yeah, super tough for everybody. I th- I think uh, you know the big guys are going to survive right now, and and the little guys, it's just it's it's pretty tough. Um, so yeah. I, I, I was really hoping I was really pulling for it based off of what they advertised, but. So what were they supposed to do different that the other people aren't? What, what were you hoping for? Um, well, first off the AP and the CPE are the same antenna, right? Um, so mm-hmm. it's 250 bucks for an AP, 250 bucks for a CPE, uh, about a 900 meter range. Um, it did do channels one through six, um, half channels and even quarter channels. Um, asymmetric splits, right? So instead of 50, 50, you got 75, 25, all that kind of stuff, 30 clients per AP. That's, that's a high number. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 120 degrees spread for that 900 meters. That's part of the reason that the distance isn't as far as it could be. Um, all based off of, uh, a two and a half gigabit POE chipset, right? So there's no, there was no SFP, which I was fine with because multi gigabit exists now. Um, and so you could literally for, you know, a low few thousand dollars, put up a pole in a subdivision and you could feed gigabit speeds in a 360 degrees. You know, I mean, you got three of them times 249.95. Yeah. It's not a lot of money. No. So you're, you're looking at that going, well, Hey, I, I can, I can do gigabit stuff. Um, especially when. You got a gigabit chips, a two and a half gigabit chipset, and you can do asymmetric splits. You can now offer um, one and a half or two gigabits total on the downside and on the upside. Maybe you're only doing 500 because most of us in the home world, um, I probably only see, I don't know, 20% of my upload used on, on my connection. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, it's really, that's not the important side um, as much as, it's advertised by fiber people, you know, Oh, get this symmetric speed. You, you know, mm-hmm. look at this, their upload sucks. And you're going, yeah, but, uh, most people don't utilize it. So what's it matter? And it's like, most people don't utilize the gigabit anyway. I mean, on average you're using, you know, 15 to 20 meg or something like that. And, uh, people are selling, you know, all these, uh, they're just trying to make it difficult for the smaller guys to, to match them and meet them and, and, uh, meet a spec that's useless, you know, pretty much. So, right. Yep, that's, but that is the name of the game, right? If you want to be in our industry, speed is the thing. How how good is your ISP? Well, hold on, let me see what the speedometer says. Yeah, it must be great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a really interesting point too. Is you know, you you talk a lot about high speed and density and stuff in the in the public forum, your WIS talks and stuff like that, and uh, being a big proponent for that. Not only because to hit you know special magic government numbers and this that and the other, especially when you start looking for funding and stuff. You know, those are so deeply intertwined. But just in general, from a competitive landscape and perspective, the ability to deliver set speed now uh, and later, especially, is, is really where a lot of the industry. I think is going. So, I mean, would you agree with that? And, you know, if so, like, what are, what do you think the biggest misconceptions that people have are about what it takes to build a a high density, high speed network that may not necessarily be true? Yeah. You know, I don't know the, the funding parts interesting. Um, It's a big argument. And I think with a lot of people, how, how are you going to um, fund your products is it possible to survive um, by not having government money or you have to have government money? I think it really there's, there's all these different ways that everybody wants to design their network with the different hardware, with the different um, network layouts, what, what hard the hardware are they going to use, how they're going to do it. So the, the funding thing, uh, Tarana, for example, I'll use that one. I just, I just posted a review a couple yeah. of days ago and some people were talking about, well, the only way you can really do this. And I, and I did put in there, I believe wholeheartedly that if you really wanted to make a go of Tarana and, and put it everywhere, government funding is the only way you're going to get that product. Um, sure. However, people made the point that 
I am self-funded. I got no government money right now. And I do have a radio and I've got CPEs and I could make it work um, in my environment. And again, I always use my environment. Um, I'm pretty clear about that. We're in a different world than, than my guys in Virginia. Um, people will pay an upfront fee, a larger upfront fee in my world than they will in Virginia. In Virginia, they They're used out. to it because they only had satellite and that was never cheap to get started up, right? Yeah, yeah. So it, it's interesting. Um, you know, Bozeman, Montana is like the, it's a huge, um, I don't know, I guess ski resort place, right? So mm -hmm. because of the sky and we, all that. We know, we watch Yellowstone, so we know what it's like. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, so you know it, Montana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's interesting. We have a huge influx of, of money that comes into our valley and uh, a lot of technology companies, a lot of people that want to live here but work somewhere else, right? Yep. And yep. So we've seen a huge, in our valley, a huge amount of growth in the um, demand for internet and, and what people will are expecting and what they'll pay for that expectation. And, and so for my company, it's helped me out. But again, I can't use that logic for my guys in Virginia. So Tirana, um, with their CPE cost of $1,000. I use $1,000 because it's a round number. It might be a little bit lower than that. But by the time you add in all the little add-ins, right? They, the recurring they, fee, the annual fee and all that stuff, speed key. Yep. The speed key and, and everything's a part, which is, which is kind of the cambium way. Um, or it used to be where, oh, uh, well, here's your antenna. Well, you didn't buy a power supply. Well, you need to buy the power supply. Oh, your bracket's not included. Buy a bracket. Oh, so that's the, oh, hold on. So hold on. Go back. So that stuff is not included. When you buy the CPE, it's just literally the radio part and not all the little accessories that go with it. So there's all these little adders. Right, exactly. So so then you can be like, well, the CPE cost is only $600. Sounds really <laughs> cool. Right up till you got to yeah. add the other $300 on for, for the other stuff. And um. Wow. That's not how I advertise it, right? So when I tell somebody it's a thousand dollar CPE, that's because I just said, well, here's all the rest of the stuff you gotta buy. So really, this is what it costs. Um, so that's that's an education on on uh, you know that kind of stuff when you're when you're looking at it and you're going, oh well, this is really only cost six hundred dollars, and then you find out there's all these other things that you gotta add in there. Um, it changes your perspective on what you can afford. Um, to do and all that if they were truly at the let's say six hundred dollar mark yeah i think it's a lot more survivable it is um, but that that thousand dollar cpe is what what kills you i don't um daps you know whatever they cost 13 grand or something like that it's yep. expensive right? but your cost is in your clients right you got 75 clients at a thousand dollars seventy five thousand dollars or you know hundred thousand dollars which is where I think you need to be. Well, if, and if, and if you look at the, the, the apparent, you know, like number of subscribers, that's the maximum for that is like a couple hundred, like 200 plus. So it's like $200,000, you know, of CPE costs versus the 14,000 of that one AP, right? So it's huge numbers, huge numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where I've traditionally, um, you know, on the ubiquity side, I could argue, um, well, because of its low cost, you can build more sites and you can and you can do more, right? Maybe for the cost of ran a site, I could build four ubiquity sites. Now I've got the coverage of those four sites, but again, then you got to maintain it and you got to make yeah. sure that it has redundancy. And I mean, you don't have to do redundancy, obviously, but we try to do redundancy in everything that we do. So everything's got a backup link or, or some other way to get there. And we will only sprawl out so far. You may see guys that, that have six links in line, um, you know, and each one of those is feeding another tower that's repeated off another and so forth. Yeah. Um, and I get it. It, it really is. Um, your environment and, and how you can maintain and run your network. Um, so in my world, I choose not to do that. Um, I'll go as deep as um, two and off of, off of two links deep, I may have a micro pop that'll shoot off of a one, but a, not another main tower or something, but that's a, that's just a personal philosophy for my network. Um, 
doesn't make it right, wrong, or otherwise. Some of these other guys, um, yeah, they'll string links for, for days. You may see six or seven of them all in line. Um, we found out a lot of issues with that. But again, um, yeah, it's, I don't know. It, it's, it's interesting with the, with the Tirana stuff and, uh, and how you can make that work in power draw and, you know, how does that change everything? And, and so that's where you get into all these sites. Have Not your solar site, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. You, could, you can barely power the CPE, never mind the <laughs> AP, right? You'd yep. have more in panel calls than you would AP calls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. They'd be almost almost equal. So, so what are your, you know, I think a lot of, um, you know, what you can and cannot do, you know, based on CPE costs, AP costs, really has to do with what you can charge, right? So, like, you know, when I always go back to, like, the property I have, the ranch I have, the first internet I had out there was, like, you know, a, a Two, it was like three by one meg or something like that. And I was paying like $90 a month, right? <laughs> for, yep. for three by one, you know? Um, and I mean, the guy could get away with it because there was really nothing else, right? And it was it was highly reliable, <laughs> right? So that was awesome. And uh, But anyway, so, so what kind of plans are you offering? You know, uh, what, what are you charging for the different rates and stuff like that? Because that makes a difference to the guy who's, you know, can't charge more than, you know, 30 bucks a month if you're charging, if, you're, if you have $99 plan. And see the Toronto thing might work out, right? It, it could it could work. Yeah, so that's the the interesting part. So we're um, we're typically the lowest cost in our in our environment, right? So we do um, right now traditionally off of our LTU, we'll do a sixty nine ninety five for a hundred by fifteen that's and uh, one hundred nine ninety five for a two hundred by thirty. That's off of the LTU um, sixty gigahertz. We do uh, you know like a two fifty by 30 for uh 49.95 and a 500 by 30 for uh like 69.95 or something like that so we take into account the technology what it takes to get it out there and things like that um tarana uh specifically we front load our costs um so this and again some people can get away with it and some people can't um we're going to charge 100 percent of of our cpe costs right up front so what's it cut? What's the install cost? Thousand bucks. But on the flip side, we're month to month, and then we will have. Um, right now, we'll continue our hundred and our two hundred, but we'll probably move the the two fifty plan in there, um, or something like that. And uh, we may end up being two hundred and fifty meg for forty nine ninety five. Yeah. So if you look at that, you go, okay, the it's front loaded. Uh, but if I look at this over time as a customer, I pay less money, right? If you, if you're a customer for a year or two years, you pay less money with me than if you go to somebody who says, well, I'll charge you a hundred dollars a month for uh, 25 meg. Your install cost is free or a hundred dollars. You're going, oh man, you know, it's easy to afford up front, but later on, you've actually paid more money than you would with me to get more speeds. Um, so that's something that, that we do. Um, but again, I think that's my environment. My, our around here, people will pay that. Yeah. I mean, if you can, if your customer is willing to pay basically the CPE costs up front, there's, there's almost no reason why you couldn't <laughs> make that model work. I mean, it's basically like government funding. It's the people paying for it right at some point, not you. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, whether it's, whether it's my tax dollars going to some wisp, you know, to help offset those costs or the people are paying it up front. I mean, that's what it's all about. Right. So then you're just looking at amortizing the, the AP. And at that point, I mean, if it handles, you know, hundred, 200 plus customers, I mean, it's just, it makes total sense. Right. So that's awesome. Right. Yeah. So that, so that works for us um, doing that in Virginia. We're, we're long, we're waiting for the three gigahertz Tirana. A um, little bit different, right? We're going to have to lower that, that upfront cost because that environment will not pay um, the same amount. Now they will pay more. Um, this was an educator. And I think this is important for everybody. And, and, and I've uh, said this a million times, everybody goes, nobody will pay anything over a hundred dollar install fee. Um, or, you know, I, I hear this, my guys in Virginia were like, Oh, people won't, they just, if I tell them there's an install fee, they, they won't sign up. Or if we tell them it's a hundred dollars, they balk at it. Then here comes Elon Musk 
you know, six hundred dollars for your antenna, and people are you know fighting each other to get it, That's, right? Like, because they're sheep, man. They're yeah. sheep. So yeah, so it's it's so that I use that as a as an example, and I go. So obviously, people are willing to pay five hundred or six hundred dollars to sure. get their internet. So it changes it, I think, for for wireless people to to look at that and go, you know what? There's absolutely a market. These people will pay. It. Yeah, I get it. There are some people that tell you, unless you offer what cable does, you know, the free install or a hundred dollar install, we're not going to sign up with you. You may lose those customers, but there's a lot of other customers willing to pay a a larger upfront cost. So now you can offset your, your, your hardware costs um, and buy a little bit more expensive hardware. If you need to buy something better for, for where you're at. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it, 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 it's so dependent, right? I mean, yeah. If you're in town and you have, you know, three different hardwired options, you know, you have, you know, um, fiber, you have uh, cable, and it's all basically free, it's pretty hard to separate, you know, $500 from me, right, to, to go with your wireless internet. Now, if I've been burnt, you know, if the customer support sucks, you know, then yeah, you have a chance of winning, but those numbers are, are way, way lower, right? Um, so yeah, it really d depends on the, the environment and the same thing as far as, like I said, you know, if you have no option, I mean, pretty much you can ask what you want, right? I mean, people have to have internet. So, you know, I'd pay, you know, again, out at my ranch, if there was no other option, I'd pay a thousand dollar install fee. I mean, I actually, because I knew his packages were low, I'm like, dude, I'll just, let me buy the equipment and let's just rent on your tower. I wanted like a point to point for myself, right? Because I wanted more <laughs> bandwidth. And he's like, no, we can't do that. Eh, whatever. So I'm like, all right, fine. I'll just, you know, pay a lot of money for your crappy internet. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I would, I would have paid a lot. I would have paid a ton, uh, to, to get, you know, whatever they can give me. So. I mean, my parents place in middle Georgia, beautiful property, dude. And they're like, come down here, move down here, build a house on this property. <laughs> I'm like, great. But there's no options, right? Like there's yeah. no data down you there. Can hear the I would dial pay up still. Yeah, it's that or like, you know, half of our raggedy LTE <laughs> that, you know, doesn't work during the day. So I would pay an obscene amount of money, you know, just yeah. to, yeah. to have access down there. But, you know, I can't, I can't work, can't do that. So, I mean, yeah. you know, especially when you start looking at CBRS solutions and, you know, if the Tarama solution works as, as well as it's touted to, I think it's going to open up a, a lot of potential uh, avenues for people. So if it's magic, which is, you know, that's always the big sort of question is, is this stuff magic? And it's like, yeah. no, it's, it's engineering. <laughs> so, but it's a lot of people have, a, I think a really hard time just accepting that everything's not completely black and white, or, you know, you can run a wisp with different technologies. So I was like, yeah. I can't make my wisp run with this, whether it be Tirana or LTE or, you know, the CBRS Camium solutions. And a lot of people just don't realize, well, you know, you can use different tools for different areas and you don't have to be absolutely one single thing. And, you know, people, it's, they, they get lost. They, they lose sight of the forest for all the trees, I think. Yeah, but and, but and the market has gone through so many of those changes, right? Like it's, it's weird. Like, you know, we started, everything was super expensive, right? We talk about a $600 CPE, you're like, uh, ah, you know, but when you first started those, you know, CB3 type solutions back then, I mean, you know, the, the, the wrap boards and stuff with radio cards in them, they were like three, $400 back in the days, what we started at. And then, you know, the market was used to that. And then ubiquity came and it was the race to the bottom. Now it's like, if I can't get a CPE for less than a hundred dollars, I ain't buying it. And now we're going back to the expensive side of things, right? People are realizing that cheap isn't better. You know, a good value is a good value, but cheap is not where you want to go. And things are are starting to get uh, get expensive again on the equipment side and uh i mean the technology is just you know incredible especially like the Toronto boxes, I mean, the, that's just art what's in there, you know, <laughs> these huge high-end DSPs doing these, you know, massive calculations for multipath. And it's, it's, it's amazing stuff, you know, but just like anything, you know, if the environment isn't exactly the way it needs to be because you got an equation is, is set, <laughs> you know, so if it's not, if you don't have the right uh, structures out there to create the amount of multipath in the direction that you need it to happen, right? Then you're not going to see the same thing. And I think that's where where people kind of get lost. They they see some of this magic happen. A lot of that testing, like even yourself, right, is just a single CPE, right? So load it up is what I'm starting to say, right? It's just like, yeah. I want to see that 200 plus, you know, I want to see what that data is like. 
Um, and uh, like I said, I mean, it's still going to do magic, obviously. Like I said, and, and you're paying for it. So it's, you know, who, who knows? Who knows where this, you know, th this might become the new thing, you know, $1,000 CBEs and fifteen twenty thousand dollars $20,000 APs, you know, might, might be the future of the WISP industry. I hope not. This stuff should get cheaper or be more inexpensive, let's say. But uh, yeah, it, it costs money to make that stuff happen. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I think um, so many wireless ISPs are talking about, well, you know, I think wireless is really declining and I'm going to fiber. Um, you see that a lot. And the truth is, I, in my personal opinion, I, I don't think one lives without the other, right? I, I think wireless is always going to be around. Fiber is obviously, as far as a technology standpoint, it's, it's, it's always going to go faster. It's always... Um, going to be more reliable in, in a lot of aspects, right? Interference or weather, things like that. But you got problems where people dig it up and, and it has reliability issues there or whatever. Everything's got its problem. But um, because of the cost of fiber, I think it also introduces the ability for these higher cost wireless products to come in and go, hey, yeah, we're not as low cost as, you know, Mimosa or Ubiquity or whatever. But we're still, you know, five or 10 times less cost than if you try to deploy fiber. So why not bring fiber to where this is at with these radios and then distribute with the radios? And that's kind of where yep. my belief is, is in a hybrid, right? Like, I think you should get as much fiber to your towers as possible. But then for distribution, you know, wireless can do it faster and lower cost than, than any other technology doesn't mean you can't overbuild it later right if if you build a subdivision with let's say you go into a subdivision and this is a plan that we have is you put up a couple of poles and you and you distribute 60 gigahertz through there as time goes on plow uh, and trench in fiber and, and bring it in there but you're you're now subsidizing your build you not only got those customers and in theory you're keeping them happy and you're offering them 200 500 whatever then as time goes on, they can also help subsidize your, your build out for fiber um, and, and kind of help you scale from there. If that's something that you're interested in doing fiber, some people still stick into purely wireless. Some people are, you know, going on the fiber wagon. Um, so it's, it's ever changing um, and the opinions are always ever changing. So, <laughs> you know, there's, there's going to be this new, fiber thing that comes out and I may look at it and go, well, Hey, that makes fiber more attractive now or whatever. Um, in my area, Yellowstone fiber, which Bozeman fiber was kind of a, a startup, a nonprofit. And then, um, uh, it's an open network, right. As an ISP, you can deliver bandwidth on top of their fiber, but they handle the fiber network. Um, they just recently got more funding and they're working with a company called utopia, um, out of salt, um, out of Utah and, uh, that company, um, you know, how things work is, is different, right? It, it's, it's not, um, the, the same technology on the fiber back end. And so we're looking at, um, one gig, 10 gig, and, you know, and of course they say you can do up to a hundred gig, gig right? but, yeah. but you're not doing that on a pawn, right? So they're, they're doing things different. Um, and I, I don't want to say exactly what it is they're doing because I don't want to be in trouble. <laughs> That's so, fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. So I'm not going to share any of that, any of that, but it, it's interesting that they're taking a different approach to fiber than, than a lot of the other guys that are going, Oh, just deploy this pawn. And, and that's the end all be all. I think even in the fiber world, there's all sorts of different mixes of, of how you do that. Um, but technology is ever changing Toronto uh, obviously proving that in the wireless industry. What I, what I hope they do is prove that five gigahertz does have um, a lot of potential to it. The manufacturers just got to do something different, right? Um, yeah. The traditional, I bought a chip and I slapped it in there and I, and that's, you know, being a little simplistic about it, but yeah. <laughs> I slapped it in here and I put a couple of connectors on it and and I'm not changing much, right? Um, LTU is kind of a, you know, something, right? It's it's their own custom silicon, and they they were trying to do something different, and they can achieve some results that nobody else achieves versus a, a Wi-Fi, um, 
but I think uh, Toronto's proving five gigahertz can do um, a lot of a lot of things that it people previously thought wasn't capable of, and now we get six gigahertz in there, right? We're hopefully getting that in there, so that expands our industry a little bit more, and so a lot of that stuff's really exciting. I'm, I'm excited to see what Mimosa comes out with. We're not strictly a one uh, manufacturer company, right? So if Mimosa comes out with something great that works man, I'll buy it and we'll use it. Yep. Um, so far, I've, I haven't seen that effect from that company, but uh, um, Cambium's no different, right? They've got uh, AX coming out. Excited to see what that does. Um, that's I think that's end of this year, um, so it's a little ways out. But uh, those, those are all uh, up-and-coming things that I think uh, everybody's looking forward to a um, lot lower costs than Tirana, right? So people are more excited about that $2,500 CPE or a $2,500 APE, uh, AP, and then a whatever for a CPE, 200 bucks or 300 bucks. Mm-hmm. Lot, lot easier to swallow. So I don't know. I'm just as excited as everybody else to see those products. Definitely. We lo- love seeing that stuff. And I think a lot of the doomers, you know, Toss and I did a whole episode about all the doom, you know, doom. whether it be a doom, <laughs> whether it be, I mean, you know, and it's been that way since the wireless industry started or any in industry, right? So, you know, whether it's Starlink or government, you know, funding, crushing, you know, with fiber bills or, you know, whatever it may be. And people just can't really seem to wrap their heads around. Like if you're just planning on doing the same thing forever, then yes, you are yeah. doomed because doomed, the world moves and the world moves fast. Right. So, I mean, yeah. it's the same way cars aren't, you know, cars aren't running out there with carburetors and 150 horsepower on big V eights. Like the, <laughs> the technology improved, the market improved. And, you know, you've got to be able to do that as well. At the same time, understanding the market that you're in and, and what makes sense. And, so. and consumer changes, right. You know, what, what you need and what the requirements are, are greatly different today than they, they were back then, you know? Um, so, I mean, some, some things are, <clears throat> will never change. Like, you know, reliability is a thing, <laughs> right? It doesn't matter how fast you are or, you know, how big of a package or how, co- you know, how cost effective you are. If it's not reliable, you're out, you know what I mean? And uh, so, so there are some things that stay constant, but yeah, I mean, it, it's constantly changing, uh, constantly evolving. And, and you know, the, the, the method of these kind of, you know, there's two type of hybrid networks now. So Caleb and I love the, the fiber wireless hybrid network, which we think all WISPs should go into. But there was a point where, like, literally, it wasn't hybrid with the manufacturers. Like, you're all Cambium, or you're all Ubiquity, or you're all Mimosa, right? And then they, they liked the, the nice NMS, you know, it's like everything talked to everything. I could have everything in my management software, and it was all cohesive. And now, like I said, we're, we're shifting away from that, where, you know, not only are you mixing uh, manufacturers, you're mi- mixing technologies now on your network, which is the most exciting for me. I love when all that shit comes together because we we talked about having standards. It would be great, you know. I mean, this proprietary <laughs> mentality that all the manufacturers are in, or it's kind of cool, I guess, right? But man, we could just achieve so much more if we could have, you know, uh, some way to make this stuff just work, you know, together better you know uh man oh that's all you want oh, a piece of cake like we can't yeah. even agree on one type of usb cable so <laughs> yeah. you just you just keep on pulling that hopium pipe brother so yeah, It'll happen. yeah. It'll happen one day one day one day i think they did make a standard like that and it was called lte and you yeah. can see yeah. how far that's gotten in this this space <laughs> yeah, so. oh yeah yeah all lte yeah. works together if you buy it it's you know I, in which okay. yeah it just is, it's a pipe dream that everybody's going to want to make everything work with each other. I mean, uh, 60 gigahertz is that way, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Teragraph. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's a standard. Everybody should work together. Go take a Cambium and try to make it work with some other Teragraph. It's not going to. Um, right. It just is the way it is in our industry. So, yeah, everybody, all the manufacturers definitely push for themselves. And, well, it's our job to figure out how we can make it work in our network with multiple vendors i guess really yeah yeah well you've done a great job thanks so how many how many subs do you have or is Um, that something you can talk about oh yeah no it's not a big deal everybody always asks me um right now uh right around 600 subs okay so and that's and that's the breakup between residential and business as well right yeah yeah so most you know and 
funny enough, we're probably we're starting to shift more towards more residential than business, right? In the right. beginning, it was more business, um, and now now it's a lot more residential. So um, it, it it was the evolution. Um, our ARPU, right? People used to ask me, "Oh, you know, but what what's your average sub?" Right? And I used to be able to say, "Oh, my average sub's like 180 bucks." Well, <laughs> you're like, "Oh man." Yeah, business plans, killing. business plans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, then you add in residential, and that's gradually gone down further and further. I think the last time we looked, we're at uh, you know like ninety two dollars or or somewhere around in in that area. So it's it dramatically changes it when you bring those kinds of things on. Right. Um, we hope to change that with some other things, um, TV, right? IPTV and uh, um, managed routers. I didn't do managed routers for years. I couldn't find a. I guess what I thought was an affordable solution, right? There's, there's a lot of them out there, but they want to $2 a month for your, you know, per sub or, you know, a buck 50, or whatever. And you're going, that's a, it's a, it's a chunk of change. Yeah. Um, it adds up. Right. So, you know, we ended up getting on the, on the TP link stuff um, and works well. People are happy with it. Um, they like the feature set. Uh, so it, it comes in at a great price point and it works well enough. I'm not going to say it's great, but, mm -hmm. um, so you, you, you know, you, you look and you got to learn from cable and they may be the big evil empire, but they're not stupid, right? They're good at marketing. They're good at getting people and they're good at figuring out how to make money. Um, some of those things are managed routers, um, things in there, you know, it's $5 for your router or you want the AX router. It's, you know, an extra yeah. 10 bucks a month or whatever. Um, and obviously people have that the ability with us to go get their own router if they choose to. But a lot of people decide, Hey, I, you know, I don't want to deal with that. I just want to call and talk to the guy who says, you yeah, know, this is the reason why you're having the problem. I don't, I don't want to have to know what is a, a negative 76 signal on strength on, on my device or whatever. Um, so a lot of that, I think a lot of wireless ISPs are shifting towards figuring out alternative ways to also bring in, um, money as well. Um, Phones in the business world, big deal in, in the business world. Residential, everybody's got a cell phone, not a big deal anymore. Yep. So um, those those are just different uh, different areas, I think, that help bring our ability as, as smaller companies, um, you know, back in more profit, I guess. Right. So how how is, uh, you know, the the TP link uh, offering? Because, you know, for for a while, it was obviously, you know, whatever you can find. And then Microtech really, you know, for for the longest time there, I mean, they had the, you know, the best lowest cost, most, you know, basic manageable, uh, you know, home routing devices and stuff like that uh, for, for people to use. And then, you know, TP link kind of came to the scene. So, I mean, is that kind of the, the, the same same thing is happening? Are they still pretty strong uh, as far as like your the WISP that you've talked to and stuff like that? Or is there a, a much wider variety of, you know, home APs and routers that people are using on in their WISPs? Yeah. So I guess the people um, that I talk to, it's, it's pretty varied, right? I think we're all in the same boat. We're all just paddling around trying to find the best thing for us. Right. I mean, I, I'd love to say, Oh my, you know, TP link is, you know, it's it and, and everybody knows it and it's just done incredible things. But for us, I think it works well. I, I know some people that run the, the cambium stuff, right. The, the, um, their routers. And I know some people that, um use um what is the other company uh it starts starts with an m um and they use microtick they'll load a script on it um mm. uh but they charge a per sub fee i know um some people that use those and i can't even think of their name Memo. The yeah Memo. yeah sorry yeah. that one took me yeah. a second too i'm like it's in there somewhere come on yeah yeah and super nice people um you know they were easy to onboard with uh as far as a company I, th I think it's a great company i just i looked at the the monthly cost and i couldn't justify it for what i was getting and that's me personally um other people i know use it and they go yeah but i can i can script this i can do this i can do whatever i love it it's it's a great product um so i think in that in that whole router world where where it's just like the wireless isp world every wireless isp is going to have their different preference on what they do why they like it why they don't like it um 
you know, for, for us, we just uh, took off with the, the TP link. And, and for me, I have knock on wood. And this is anytime you say anything, of course, it always bites you in the butt. But <laughs> um, I, I have zero people that complain about the TP link stuff that we put in. Um, so for me, that's a win, right? If, if people are calling me. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm going, well, hey, this is great. We, we put in three of these or four of these. Or, you know, I had one guy that's got this large house. We put six of them in and we try to hardwire them if we can, right? Not repeat them. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, they, they pull up the app. We give full control. Um, and again, that's, a, that's an ISP thing. I talk to other people and they go, oh man, don't give them full control because they can screw it up. <laughs> Absolutely, they can. Um, but I got some people that go, yeah, but check this out. Look at this. I, I just turned off my kid's Xbox. You know, he's, he's not doing that anymore. Or we've got antivirus intrusion prevention and, and filtering. Right. Um, that was a big deal for, for a mom. She wanted to filter out uh, pornography. Right. So she checks a couple of boxes on there and, and it does an okay job. It's not going to catch everything, but it does an okay job. Um, so, so people have been really, they're easy for us to deploy. My, my technician, has a box of them, right? He's got like 20 of them in his van. And then he just goes, Oh, you, you want one of these? Yeah, I can let me whip that out for you. And, and yeah. away it goes. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a good upsell um, for us. But again, TP link, it's, it's not the end all be all there's, there's a lot of good products out there. Um, and uh, everybody has mixed results with it. Yeah. So. I hate I hate the, the the monthly recurring costs of things. You know, I mean, that's something I think that's changed in industry as well. I mean, everything used to be so manual. We used to do everything. And, you know, now to, you know, manage your network, it's, you know, two dollars per sub. Right. And yep. if you want to use this this routing solution, it's uh, another dollar twenty five. That's just taking away out of that monthly fee. And it's like, oh, you know, uh, having having our, uh, our call center is expensive. Well, you can outsource that for another three dollars per sub per month month and before you know it it's like you're charging 60 bucks a month but like 15 dollars of that is going to like all these things to manage your network you know uh and and so so the point is, is like the tp link and stuff like that it's kind of cool when it's like all built in the box it's pretty simplified and they could just turn things on and off and and you know have these things without you know it being managed externally you know i mean then you have presim and these other things to manage your your you know quality of your experience and stuff like that it, it all starts to add up and i think that's a huge disconnect from how things were to how they are now you know oh yeah yeah, I mean, that's the, I, I will say that is the one thing that I guess TP-Link for us, um, I talk about that that price and everything. So TP-Link's uh, like 25 cents a sub, right? Oh, so there um, is, okay, I, I didn't catch that yeah, part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is a there is a cost, with, but, you know, you're talking 25 cents. Yeah, right. that's, that's a lot more manageable. It, give me like three things or four things at 25 cents. I can afford that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it, it depends on your cost basis, but also like, what are you paying for on a monthly reoccurring versus what it would take to staff out and build your own solution, right? So that is that measurement you've got to take into account is the value there from a business perspective or, you know, do I just do everything? You know, I don't need a call center. I don't need the management when I can do all this on my own, but you know, then you've got a staff of 30 people you got to pay and you know, you've got to take that consideration into account. So some of it's gimmicky. Some of it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, who decides to what pay for what makes a, a whole lot of difference from one, you know, one outfit to the other. So you're running lean and small and trying to do a lot with a handful of folks because you can't find staff, then maybe it makes a lot of sense. But, you know, if you've got 100,000 customers, then at that point, well, yeah, let's in-house a lot of yeah, that. Yeah. So it's yeah, a, you it's could, a you could always charge more too, right? So you can make up for it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's always the That's always the thing is a balancing all of it and all of our equations are different. So, you know, it's hard to say what's, what's right for one company versus another um, consulting that I guess that's, was really educated me on that. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I'm like everybody else. When I started out years ago, I'm like, oh, here's the way you do it. This is the <laughs> way that works. This is the equation. Right. And then you show up at the different state or different place and you're like, Oh man, that my equation doesn't, do squat for this guy. In fact, <laughs> this does not, not work at all. <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah, I, I, it's, um, 
it's interesting. I mean, the, th- the things that we do and try, and we try a lot of it, right? I tried the Cambium routers, you know, back to the routers thing and, and the TP link. And we tried Vilo as the, the new one coming in that's lower cost and, and it lacks a whole bunch of feature set. And I don't even know, DDWRT and trying to script our own and, you know, and all this stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, so that, that equation is just um, what we figured out for us for what works. And, uh, you know, maybe other people listen to it and they go, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to try TP link. It works for this guy. Um, great. But uh, then again, they may come back and be like, oh, Chris Johnson's an idiot. idiot. I tried the TP link and <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Like, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, yeah. 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 So, Another thing that I've heard in the market, you know, people uh, or wisps, and, and it's typically like the younger wisps, the newer ones are like, hey, you know, how do we raise our prices or, uh, you know, have, have you done it yet? Because, you know, every, everybody's raising their prices right now. The cost of hardware is going up, supply chain issues, all these other things. Um, what's kind of your take and, and, and what do you see as far as raising the price? Is that something that's going to happen for your service? Because, again, things are going up. I, I just recently saw that. Uh, one manufacturer was starting to charge more for the uh, like the, the the firmware upgrades or something for for their radios or something like that. And it's like, well, that's software. Software doesn't the cost doesn't go up. You know, it's materials raw materials, but you know yeah. these things you know shouldn't go up. Are you seeing that? Are you thinking about that? Is that an option for you? A possibility? Yeah. So I think for us. Um it's possible. Uh, I don't, I think like all businesses, we can only absorb so much, right? Mm -hmm. Um, for us, it's a little tougher than others. Uh, we've always traditionally been the, the lower cost. So we've trimmed as much fat as we could. Right. So we're, we're trying to compete with cable and we're trying to compete with the fiber guys. And so we've cut a lot of our margins out. Um, so now, of course, in order to absorb extra costs, we're, we're going to have to raise up our costs. Um, that never goes well, ever. Um, <laughs> every, I can tell you that I, I probably get, in fact, we just laughed about this yesterday. A guy calls in, you know, I'm with Spectrum. We're looking at changing our service. They just raised our rates. And I'm thinking, well, f- first off, you know, what, what is this? The end of your six months that you knew about? The answer, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like you signed up at, Forty nine ninety five, knowing full well that in six months it, w- it was going to change. But even when you tell people that and they're getting and they just totally forget about the fact that for the last six months they got something for really low cost. You've now increased the, the price and it's a negative. No matter what you do, people take it very negatively. Um, we have some people that, uh, you know, I've talked to. And I said, yeah, we may have to change our costs or something depending on, you know, how fuel goes and, you know, and all these other things. And some people go, oh, yeah, you know, we understand and, and you know, we own a business and, and it makes sense. And uh, then you get the other side that goes, well, you better not change because or else. And you're going, OK, well, or else. I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> like, we got to be here tomorrow. So, right. um so yeah, I, I think that's a super touchy subject for for all ISPs. Um, if you're in an area that's highly competitive, right? We've got four other wireless ISPs, and we got multiple fiber vendors and cable and and all that. Um, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, hey, I get it. I mean, what, what are they going to do? Not have yeah. internet? Yeah, no. Elon, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah. A captive market but, is a captive market, you know? Yeah, yeah. So so again, different for different different people, right? Um, even if you're a place that only has a, a another competitor, right? There's only one other competitor, still fairly easy for you to, to make some adjustments. So I think for us guys that are in the competitive market, it'll be tough. Um, traditionally, um, like I said, we've always been lower cost and we try to maintain that, but uh, cable makes that tough, um, tough on us because they are the, the big gorilla. And, uh, so, so we'll see, I think ultimately we may end up having to change, um, Tirana is definitely going to make that. So that's one of the things that we looked at, right. They, we got that monthly fee with them. We're basically just, I think, um, end up passing it on. Um, I'm not gonna, you know, jack up the price by $15 a month or something, but I'm going to pass on the price of, of the, you know, what I got to pay for that. Um, 
the fear there is, of course, once you're locked into a, a, a platform that you can't leave, those costs could ultimately rise more and more, right? I mean, there's yeah. nothing saying later on they don't go, well, it's $15 a month for our back end. You either pay it or all of your stuff is useless. That is a fear, right? Um, so I don't know. Um, like the rest of us, I don't have the equation solved. I can go off of my best guesses. Um, and uh, right now we're, we're sticking to our guns. We haven't changed anything. Um, we can run pretty um, low cost in comparison to the larger guys. Uh, but uh, Tirana will cause us to maybe do something different and we'll have to market that different, right? So if you're in this area, we have this other product this is the pricing for that product. Um, I realized that over in this other market, it's a little bit different cost, but um, that's because we're, we're using different gear. Um, yeah. So, cause we're not going to stack one of everything on the tower. So <laughs> yeah. So ultimately um, we'll, we'll see where that leads. I, I don't know. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see <clears throat> how well it plays. Uh, speaking of Toronto again, you know, how well it plays with all your other stuff. Right. And I mean, it, it almost seems like it's, it's gotta be, like you said, its own little service area because once you start firing that stuff up, and because it's just it's a huge noise generator running eighty megahertz channels, and you got four of these things, and it's just ah man, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, we'll, it's gonna we'll you know, wisps will start hating each other again. You know, we just started we just started you know unifying with horns, bringing everybody together. We can kind of manage networks and coordinate stuff, and now it's gonna be like fire. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. burn, burn them down. You know, so yeah, we'll see be interesting to see how that goes yeah i'm curious to see the reuse of one um that's yeah. a that's a big game changer i think it, uh, i mean that's hugely spectral efficient efficiency right there yeah absolutely absolutely right so we'll we'll see how that works right it's, it's hard to do with one access point um obviously getting a hold of the equipment is extremely hard right now which is another factor to, to factor in right uh so needless to say, we don't put all of our eggs in, you know, in one basket, more or less, just like everybody else. You're going, well, Mimosa next month is coming out with this AX. What happens if, um, you know, Tirana doesn't work out right now? It's just kind of a, a small investment. I mean, smaller, right? I mean, it's yeah. It's R&D <laughs> cost, man. R&D cost on your side. It's just cost of doing business, you know, and that's, and that's the thing, you know, it's, it, there are very few that I've seen that are actually really in production with it, right? Most of them, most of the things you see popping up on social media is just a, hey, I got my first AP and it works great. You know, I can aim it backwards and I get 600 meg, you know, to this <laughs> one client, you know, it's like, great, yep. we'll get all the other ones fired up and let's see what happens, you know, so... Yeah, yep. so we'll, we'll we'll circle back, you know, after uh, after the new year or something like that, and see how things are going, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, ultimately, that's what we're gonna have to do is just load it up, see what happens, and we we are testing, right? I'm I'm not going all in, right? I don't want anybody to think that. Oh my God, he decided Tyrannus the thing, and if he decided that, maybe we should look at it. we're we're in the testing phase. We're gonna see how it works. Over the next few months, we'll add on a few sectors. And then if it doesn't work out, yeah, it's a loss that I have to absorb. Um, and and like all of us, we would absorb costs, uh, losses somewhere. I did it in IPTV was a huge loss. Um, and with some other people. And, is that, and now, is, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but is that the recent thing? Because I remember I did see you start on Facebook, like another group for IPTV stuff. So is that not happening anymore? The recent oh, thing no, that you- yeah, so so that one's happening. That one okay. actually is out of the the three, right? This is the most promising one. And um, we did kind of partner with them. They are a small company. Um, absolutely. Uh, but uh, the reliability, the, the, the scaling that they've done, the, the back end um, for, del for the delivery of the TV and all that's really worked out. Um, and the product is just... I mean, for the most part, it's it's a, a really good looking product. Um, I tried some others, um, Rodeo TV, right? That was a huge investment for us. Um, I got a whole bunch of it in my basement. If anybody wants to buy some of those, little <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, bringing endorsements, uh, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. It didn't it didn't work out. Um, 
and that's really where I'm going to leave that one. I, I, uh, I know some other places that, it, that tried to rodeo. It didn't work out. We looked at real choice, um, in my area. Again, this is my area. Uh, the cost for getting the bandwidth and backhauling it and doing everything to one of their locations was cost prohibitive, right? I, I had this, um, I think when it was all said and done, I was going to be $3,800 a month or something like that, just in pure, you know, reoccurring costs and some, and I'm going, man, I, I don't know. I just can't afford that. Um, had I been in downtown Denver or something like that? Yeah. It's a different story. Um, so yeah, watch it TV. Um, we're super excited about it. Uh, it's, it's a growing product. Um, we're adding a few people on. It's not an astronomical amount. In fact, it's only a few every so many months because it, people don't realize what it takes to actually onboard TV. It's a lot more in depth and it does take a lot of time to get everything functioning uh, to the point where I would think you'd want to sell it to a customer, right? This isn't buy a box, you put it in there, you give it an IP address and, and away it goes, right? Uh, you got to have dedicated point to point um, to at least the data center that we're in or back to the head end. Um, then you got to pull your local uh, channels off air. So you got to set up antennas and string that, and then you got to import that into the server and you got to get it integrated. And, and uh, depending on the network topology and how um, things work out, we are doing unicast. So it does make things a lot easier. Um, multicast is an option, but, typically nobody's choosing multicast because it's a pain to to make work in in the wireless is the way we're structured most yeah, places sure. um but uh yeah so it's that that's kind of it but again that's um you know it's an it's an upsell you can make 15 at the low end you can make 15 bucks a sub pure profit um on the upper end you can make 65 dollars a sub right and uh it's it's pretty easy to go head to head with satellite um mm -hmm. it's harder against cable or your hulus but even those are getting easier because those guys are raising their prices right you know netflix and all this netflix was five bucks when it started now what <laughs> yeah. are we 17 or 16 dollars you know and hulu was 49.95 when it started for hulu live and now the base price is 69 and then you want a few things and then pretty soon you're a hundred and something dollars so um they're making it so um, IPTV, if you can get in it at the right price, can be profitable. And there are other guys that have been doing it for, for years um, with different products like Moby TV and, and some of these others. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, again, just happens to be part of my equation to do watch it. Yeah, I mean, I we we had uh, Spencer Poos on on our show uh, a couple months ago or something like that, and he's he does a lot of MSP stuff and and streaming TV is one of those things that he does as well. So, yeah, it's interesting to see uh, how all that stuff is coming in. Like, you know, for a while, voice, uh, you know, was was a thing, you know, and it kind of went away, and it seems like it's coming back now, right? To try and sell, you know, home, you know, phone service basically over VoIP over your network. So. Okay. Um, those are pretty much all the major points I have, I guess, other than one sort of wrap up point is if you, if you had the ability to just completely start a new, you know, you sold out and then you, you started another one, you know, down the road or wherever it may you're be. You're not compete wore off and everything. Yeah. You're not compete wore off or, you know, all those things are you Thanos snapped out of existence, whatever. <laughs> right. Hypothetically <laughs> speaking. Oh, we're going to have a graphics guy do that. Just make him disappear yeah. from the screen. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we might be asking for a lot, but, uh, they're like, stop committing us to this but anyways if you were to start all over new, what do you think you would approach differently from the you know the life lesson perspective or you know conversely like uh, the the new guy that comes up to you is like hey i want to start a whips what main areas should i focus on you know what's not not all the details what's the right path i guess would be how i would you know sort of frame that yeah i mean so the <laughs> The, the thing about starting all over, which this is the cool part is if you're, if you're starting today, you get all the technology of today and all the wireless ISPs that exist, they're having to forklift everything, right. To get to that. Um, so, you know, I mean, ultimately I think it's always, if you're, if you're getting to start today and you got the money or, or whatever, 
um, you're, you're further ahead than your competitor is. Um, but for me and the, the lessons are always going to be, you know, power, right? Power for me, I, I believe 90% of my issues that I saw at all my sites always came back to power, you know, equipment failure or, um, ethernet ports that don't seem to work right anymore or something like that. And you go, Oh yeah, well, it's the manufacturer. It's net Onyx's fault. Well, it's not necessarily net Onyx's fault. Right. Um, which I've seen a lot of that, you know, they, yeah. they got this, it's burnt up or that's burnt up. They didn't ground. And, and so when I say power, it's the whole thing, right? Grounding is a big part of that. Yep. Um, so those, those are the lessons I think that the new people can take from, us that have burnt up all the equipment and we've <laughs> done all of that, right? Like You've when let I tell all the you, magic smoke out many times. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I, I tell you, don't go to Staples and buy that APC UPS and plug it in and use that as yeah, but I just don't have any money. And I get that you don't have money, but you're gonna spend more money trying to un- fix what you just broke by burning everything up. And and that's where a lot of people have learned that lesson, even though I told them up front right and that's the hard part about telling people something is a lot of people got to learn it for themselves no matter what you tell them like hey here's the secret sauce do it this way they do it the other way just to see if you were correct or not right (laughs) and um you know power i would say power is probably the biggest thing that i've learned um doing dc uh rectifiers and ac isolation right we run an ac isolator at every at every site um and then that goes into the rectifier. And then we also, um, you know, the other thing we did that gave us the flexibility now that we have more money, right. In the beginning, we started out doing the EPS 16 switches and the, and the net on switches, right. Because it powers your radio and, and that's just cheaper to do. And now we're on a, on a packet flux with a switch and the packet flux allows me to use any switching mechanism or any router mechanism behind it and power our equipment. And it works with any variation of equipment. Um, so a lot of it comes down to, to money, right? How much money do you have to start with? And then that's going to determine how I build the site. But if I got a lot of money, yeah, sure. I'm going to show up with, you know, whatever packet flux and rectifiers and ACI slaters and all the grounding and all that done. And then from there, um, you know, the equipment's just a, that's a preference thing. You know, how do you want to design it? What do you want to use with? We're a big LTU and, and symmetrical horn, right? I'm a, I'm a huge asymmetrical horn guy. Um, it, it's just, it's been our preference on, on that hardware for, for years. Um, that doesn't make that right. And that's not a secret. It's not like a wisp altering, um, thing, but I think DC power is absolutely, uh, I wish I would have told myself, you know, Hey, doing a solar site was a dumb thing. Yeah, I don't know how much soul, I don't know how much money I got invested in that. Yeah. I mean, if you think into the fact that I've got a side by side four wheeler with tracks and, you know, and this generator and all this stuff, in this one little site that was supposed to be really easy and cheap to do, I don't know, sixty-five, seventy thousand dollars. Wow! Right? <laughs> oh, you know? and you're like, uh, well, yeah, that didn't really turn out the way I wanted it because every time I turned around, I was learning something new. Batteries, right? Yeah. Oh, my batteries are freezing. Get these kind of batteries. Well, those batteries didn't do any better. And when you got twenty-four batteries in there, um, it costs a lot, right? Uh, I think. The AGMs, the last AGMs we bought were $360 a pop, you know, and you got 24 of them. Yeah. Um, you know, and then you're, you start out with one kind of solar panel and then you learn that, oh, well, this other, sol- you know, monocrystalline is better than this one. And, and, and then, you know, this manufactures this efficient and, and you got to look at efficiencies, right. And, and solar panels aren't efficient. I think my, my most efficient solar panels, 20 and a half percent or something like that mm-hmm. efficient. Yeah. Um, and how to combine that. And, oh, well now I just changed my amperage. Now I got to change my solar controller. And so I've morphed this, what was supposed to be cheap solar site into this big expensive thing. And 
after you hike up the side of a hill enough times, pretty soon you're buying the vehicle to get up there. Right. I mean, so that's um, for me personally, solar was, was one of those educators that I don't, um, yeah, I wish I knew all the stuff back then about that. And I wouldn't have had to go through all those pains of learning that in my environment, we get way less sun. So um, what one guy goes, Oh, I've only got get two pa- panels down here in Arizona and everything works great. I got to have like six or, you know, something like that to, to have the equivalent because of our, our area. Um, so those are, I would say that's um, you know, for me, those are my biggest things um, at least in the, the networking side of, or not in the network, but in the hardware side of things for, for power delivery. Um, the rest of it is, is hard to say because, um, everything's changed so much as, as far as that's concerned. You, you know, micro tick routers have been kind of such a big part of wireless ISPs now, you know, it's the low cost go to, um, for routing your network, um, depending on your designs and, and things like that. Um, whether we would do, uh, all of that in our core again, probably not. We've pulled all of our micro stuff out of our core. Right. Um, I tried Juniper, right. And, I, and Juniper works. I put it in there and my MX 480 never had a problem. Um, we didn't license it because quite honestly, I can't afford to license a MX 480 at a hundred and some thousand dollars that they want for it. And so, um, we found, uh, an alternative, which is, uh, Danos. It gives me, um, all the ability to do all the natting and the routing and the things that we want to do into a box. Um, and so for me, it, it works really well for, for what we're doing. Um, but again, I went through this education, right? I bought the $25,000 Juniper used from somebody else. And yeah, you know, knowing what I know now, I'd rather bought the $1,600 uh, or $2,600 server, put some cards in it and loaded this free operating system. So that would have saved me a lot of money. You know, those are the educational things, I guess, that, that you learn over time is how to cut costs, where to cut them. Um, but again, my solution isn't going to be for everybody, right? Everybody's got a different preference on what routers and what switching and how to run the network. I don't think there's one right way to route a network or, or design your network or, um, so all of that stuff is still, you know, just kind of up in the air. Um, but that's, that's it. Um, I think for us, um, you know, as far as education um, and, and things that I would do differently. Um, the rest of it, I think, is all still just a big learning process for the rest of us. You know, what what's the new hardware? How does it fit? Um, all that stuff's ever changing. Um, yeah, I think that's, those are some excellent points. You know, everyone, when they get, when they're new to the industry, they want to look at all the sexy stuff. So it's the radios, yeah. right? Cause they're like, I can put a gig in the sky, make it go everywhere. <laughs> and then they get past that and they're like, ah, oh, t-shirts and trucks and vinyl wraps and stuff. But like uh, the grounding, the power distribution side is definitely one of the more boring aspects of it perhaps. Yep. But at the same time, if that don't go, your network don't go. So you know, yep. it's, it's building building a strong foundation and good bones, and then the rest of it just will kind of come naturally. I think so. Those are those are really really good points for anybody new out there listening, or anyone who's been doing it a while and has been kind of cobbling up some of that things. Like that that'll that'll be the stuff that bust you. So, yep. Well, toss you uh, got anything else you want to cover, or we we think we're going to wrap this one up. Yeah, no, I mean, that was really in depth. I think we went over a lot of great topics. I mean, obviously, Chris, you bring a, a, a lot of knowledge to the table. I mean, you're, you're pretty well known uh, in social media as well. So I think it'll be great for, you know, our, your, your peers to, to see you and hear you and stuff like that. You know, it's hard. It's hard to judge a person sometimes, obviously, from what they type, right? You can't, uh, right. you can't sense that stuff. And, you know, just, you know, putting you out there like that. I think it really, really helps the industry. I know you, you like to help people. So yeah, uh, I thank you for all your time today and uh, all the knowledge that you dropped on everybody. It was really good stuff. Yeah, it was fantastic content. So anyone looking for you, uh, you know, where, where can they find you? You post on Wist Talk a lot. I think this is where a lot of folks know from you. So on Facebook and the Wist Talk groups, 
Uh, your website is getskynet.com, I believe. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I was like, I looked at it like an hour and a half ago, but I'm like, again, <laughs> short-term memory issues too. So I can't be throwing a lot of stones there. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay. Tassos, uh, folks looking for us, where can they find us? Yeah, find us all over on social media. Facebook is a great place, Instagram, our YouTube channel, and of course our website, rfelements.com. All right, all right. Well, everybody, until we talk to you again next time, y'all be good. Take care, everybody. See ya. See ya.